Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 793. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm Isabel Vaughan Spruce. And today's date is March 8th, 2023. All right, welcome to a special episode of Anglican Unscripted. Every once in a while, George and I get to venture out and interview people around the world. I have Isabel, who's been making the news over in the UK for a couple months now. And we're going to talk about a couple important topics. One is silent prayer. One is kind of the, the the abortion industry that's occurring in the UK. And maybe even reflective on thought crimes. Uh, first of all, Isabel, welcome to the program. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay. So you made the news because you were arrested for silently praying in a buffer zone outside an abortion clinic. And um, before we really get into what you're no notorious for, tell us a little bit about yourself. So this is something I've been doing for about 20 years now. Um, and I guess initially I was probably inspired, um, well, motivated rather by recognizing the humanity of the child in the womb and I, I wanted to do something about that the fact that, that, that the humanity of the child in the womb was, was being disrespected through abortion um, but getting involved in it about 20 years ago as you can imagine I've been doing this pretty much every week since then going outside abortion centers and, and, and offering alternative to women I've met a lot of women and couples um, going through very difficult situations, a lot of people who've had abortions and are considering them. And this has really opened my heart up to the the problems that women face in, in difficult pregnancies and the damage that abortion can do. And, and because of that, I guess I've got quite a different motivation now to what I had initially. I mean, obviously, I still passionately care about the humanity of the child in the womb. Mm -hmm. But I think the damage that abortion inflicts on women alone is enough to make me pro-life. And I've seen so much damage that abortion has inflicted on women and on men as well who often aren't recognized um, as being affected by abortion um, but this is something that, that really motivates me now to do the work I do yeah it's it's we you and I were born into uh, an existing abortion industry in our countries and it's been something we knew all our lives but I, I find just some awful statistics not just the frequency with people people search out abortions, but that one in five women in the UK are forced into an abortion against their will. Um, that, that hurts my and heart. I would certainly so say that's, that's echoed in the, in the stories I hear from women when I'm talking to them. Mm -hmm. So many of them are being pressured and it's not, it's not that they want an abortion, but it's that they feel that this is really the, the only choice, which is why the, the term pro-choice really grates to me um, when you're actually talking to women so often it's it's a man in their life who is maybe pressuring them in some way you know even if it's not telling them to get an abortion it's saying to them if you don't have the abortion i'm going to leave which yeah. is for many women as good as telling them to get the abortion mm. um or just other circumstances that in their life that really make them feel that they've got no other options financial difficulties accommodation problems maybe their um legal status in the country things like that, that that make it really really challenging for them to continue the pregnancy um, and yet they're not being offered viable options by abortion centers um, i remember just talking to a, a young woman a while ago and she was saying she went into the abortion center with a list of questions to ask she started on the question number one and they said to her it's as simple as this do you want the abortion or not and in a panic she said yes and took the pills which she she deeply regretted and that wasn't what she really wanted she wanted to have her questions answered um, so it's tragic that we're hearing stories like this happening. Yeah, that's, it is. Now, you were arrested for praying, and I want to talk a little about a prayer in this context, because I am told by atheists that prayer is ineffective, and that uh, any prayer I'm doing, I'm wasting my time, and, and I, I shouldn't even attend to it, and that it has no power. Yet, you've been doing this for 20 years, and you were praying outside a facility that closed down. I have seen so many miracles, and I can only describe it as that, with the work that I'm doing. You know, I, obviously, when you when you're doing work like this, you, maybe your motivation is to is to help others and provide others with alternatives. But the graces I have received, you know, particularly spiritually, it's just really 
opened up my, my heart to this issue. Um, and I just feel God has really kind of expanded me just through the, as I say, through these miracles that he's He's given just time and time again. And the closing of the abortion center was one of them in itself, an, an absolute answer to prayer. It was the um, first abortion center to open in the UK that I was praying outside. Um, they did about 10,000 abortions a year, um, the, the fourth busiest at that time. And, and in a way, from a logical perspective, no reason why it would close down. But I remember the abortion center manager S coming out, she came out with a bag of donuts to offer them out um, and said she was going to look at work in, an, in another field rather than an abortion. She'd become so disillusioned. And I just remember the various members of staff embracing me like like they were really pleased too that it was going to close down. Um, and it was it was a really moving occasion, um, you know, not just for us who'd been praying for it, but it seemed that way for this from the staff's perspective as well, which was so lovely. I remember so many of the young women who'd worked there who told me that they felt cursed by their work, and that was their words, not mine. Um, so it was lovely to think that they might be able to find work in another area that, that you know, wouldn't leave them feeling that way every day. So we have established prayer works. We have established that if you want to be an abortion mill and provide uh, abortions on demand, um, you should fear prayer. And we see now that the atheist and the uh, abortion mills fear prayer enough that they set up what we call buffer zones. Uh, describe for me a, a buffer zone. So over here at the moment, what we have are actually called um, PSPOs, so they're public space protection orders. Um, uh, and a lot of people would just from a familiar perspective, like you say, would just call it a buffer zone. So basically mm -hmm. it's an area, a zone around the abortion center which prohibits certain types of behavior. And that's quite important to stress because some people think it bans people. It's like a restraining order and that's not the case. Um, it would ban behavior. And particularly one of the types of behavior that's banned is, is protesting. Um, and and in, 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 our, in Birmingham, where I am in, in England, um, it says things like, you know, any act, engaging in any act of approval or disapproval of abortion. It's quite ambiguous in its wording. Um, and quite confusing and, and quite far reaching. And it does actually even mention prayer and counseling in there as well. And, and also just certain words like um, womb, um, hell, um, soul, I think even mum might be mentioned in there. W words that, you know, you would really think, um, you know, it's not, not just banning the word abortion, but even words connected to it. It's, it's very far reaching in, in, in what it prevents. Mm -hmm. um you were arrested. I read that you were found innocent by the uh, the court. Uh, certainly there's evidence against you for silent brain. It, it was a really strange situation. So mm -hmm. um, I was, as you said, I was, I was arrested and um, searched, taken to the police station. And when I was under caution, I was interviewed or interrogated or however you want to see it. And they actually wanted to know what I'd been thinking about, what I'd been praying about. And I remember even repeating that back to the officers, you know, you, you want to know what my prayers were for? And they said, yes. Um, so clearly I, I told them how I'd, I'd been praying for people I knew who'd been hurt by abortion. Um, people like my friend Amy, who'd, who'd been raped and pressured into having an abortion, which she ended up deeply regretting. Um, for people like my friend Natalia, who took abortion pills and passed that child at home, saw that child in the toilet and was traumatized from that. Um, so those were the people I was praying for. And, and in a way, maybe it was a, an opportunity to, to share that with the police officers of, of the damaging effects of abortion. Um, but, but that was what they wanted to know. And as I say, subsequently, I was, I was charged on four counts of engaging in an act intimidating to service users and that's particularly interesting because the abortion center was closed when i was there so how anything i could was doing could possibly have been intimidating service users the mind boggles but you know clearly that's what they think my prayer does it's intimidating people who aren't even there okay. um, they obviously uh, have greater respect for it than we do yeah i mean and we have to be honest it should Mm. Uh, yeah, that's the way the Holy Spirit prayer, works. Prayer, as we know, <laughs> prayer is never there to intimidate. Prayer, um, <laughs> prayer is there to help um, and it's, convict. It's, not it's there to convict, enlighten. Situation. Yeah, absolutely. So, mm. um, and it's so wonderful to hear this Holy Spirit, you know, breaking out in this way. 
um, but they ask you what you're thinking. Uh, this to me delves into a, a famous book in 1884 where we have thought crime and we have double speak. And this is a great example of double speak. This is a great example uh, of the freedom of slavery. And in as such, I I have to have you in the program and ask, is this something that is still taught in your society, the book 1984? Do you have a, a reference from school of reading it at any point? I do. Um, a, a long time ago, I remember reading it. And it, the amount of people who have quoted 1984, it's, it's encouraging to see that some people still remember it. Um, but sadly, we don't seem to have learned from it. Um, you know, they say how truth is stranger than fiction. And it, it seems in, in this case that um, they haven't learned from the book. It's, it seems to be becoming a reality. It's not a case of what might happen. It's a what case of is, is happening now. Um, to, and as I say, some people have said oh, it wasn't about prayer, but clearly it was. This is what I was being quizzed about in, mm -hmm. in, in the police station. Okay. Now, recently, you've been uh, detained again. And tell us what happened there. Yeah, so just to stress, I was completely vindicated last mm -hmm. time. I went to court. Um, the prosecution was asked what evidence they had, and they said none. They were even asked twice. They said they had no evidence. Um, so I was found not guilty um, on all charges. So a few weeks later, I did exactly the same thing again, which I'd just been acquitted of. Went and silently prayed near the abortion centre. No posters, no leaflets, not engaging with anyone, not speaking out loud, not holding a Bible or a rosary beads or anything that was manifesting my prayer. I was just standing there silently praying inside my head. And this time they sent six police officers with a police van to come and arrest me. Um, and, and I was you're told very, by one of You are very intimidating. They're sending a, a brigade to come and get you. I think I must have the most powerful prayers, you know, <laughs> or at least they think I do. To, to, it's going to need six officers to tackle them. Um, but I mean, I jest, but it, is, it, it just was just absolutely crazy that this police officer was actually saying to me, that my prayers were an offence. I mean, that was actually the words he said more than once. Mm -hmm. and, and when I said, I, you know, I, I would have to disagree, he became even more emphatic that they, they are an offence. The fact that someone can even hear themselves saying those words and it, it doesn't make them concern themselves. You know, what have I just said? Um, as I say, people who, who, who maybe, I don't know whether he was a praying person himself, but who can seriously think that this is some sort of criminal activity nowadays? You know, what well, state are we in? And there, there's the, the problem. He did not know the content of your prayer. How could it be intimidating? How could it be intimidating? How could it be against the law? How could it be a crime if you don't know the content? Uh, prayer can be ambiguous. Uh, we are you know, certainly told in First Timothy to, to pray without ceasing. And, uh, you know, I, I don't understand how they're going to come at this other than have prayer crimes and thought crimes. And, well, but I'm reading now in something called Clause 10 uh, of the per Public Order Bill will criminalize any form of influence outside of abortion facilities, including the form of silent prayer. This is, this is really, really sad. So this was um, debated this week in Parliament in, in, in London. And um, there was, um, people were trying to, what, some of the politicians were trying to um, put forward an amendment to at least say that silent prayer would, would not be treated as criminal. But sadly it was lost. I think it was 116 to 299 votes. Mm -hmm. um, so to think that 299 members of parliament considered it acceptable to say that silent prayer is an offence or, or is in some way intimidating or harassing. That in itself is, is, is a really, really sad situation that we've got ourselves into in this country. And I think the repercussions are going to be huge. Well, I mean, the good news is uh, England has a church state. You're part of the Church of England. I'm sure the Archbishop of Canterbury has come out in, in support of you, and I didn't get to see the press release. Have you uh, heard of any support from uh, the state church? No, I haven't, no. Um, I mean, obviously, in individual 
Christians have sure. been very supportive and I've been overwhelmed with support. Um, but I feel this is, from a spiritual perspective, I think it's a battle from the ground up, not from the top down, um, as so often seems to be the case sometimes with the church. Um, and that's not to say individual members might be very supportive. Um, but as I say, you know, by and large, if, if we're talking, you know, with the, the Church of England, um, I might know indiv individual members who've been very, very supportive, but not, um, you know, generally higher up in the hierarchy. Um, but we need to pray for them. Sometimes we get, get what we deserve with the church. You know, sometimes we're not praying enough for our leaders um, mm -hmm. and for those who are, who are guiding us and in positions of authority. Well, clearly, they're probably going to be under a lot of spiritual attack themselves, and we do need to pray for them to be strong. I think that's a good point. Uh, you know, especially in terms of uh, looking at this from a difference in our countries. Here in America, anytime a, a, up to 10 years ago, anytime there was a law uh, passed that would o oppress our freedoms, if we find in our constitution, people would get up and protest. Um, no way are you going to cut our freedom of speech, left and right. Uh, in fact, you go back to the 1970s, the most uh, vigilant protectors of free speech were the liberals and universities. But now we've hit a, a, a cancel culture, a dead stop in those protections, where if I stand up and say, I don't think that's right, I will get canceled. I mean, I, every time I have a show like this and I put it on YouTube, I'm in danger of YouTube canceling um, any future discussions. And that would be very, very sad because as a platform, it works really well for this type of show. But in your country as well, you are experiencing a cancel culture where those who are kind of willing to give you coffee and comfort while you're, you're doing this ministry are afraid to stand up now because they don't want to have attention drawn to their support of your cause. It, it's, it is a very sad situation. And especially, as I say, it's, it's gone further than just maybe somebody not being able to have a platform to speak or having their event cancelled, to actually have thought, our silent thoughts, our silent prayers being treated as a crime. I think if we don't stand up for this now, what are we going to stand up for? Um, and I think maybe some people are a little bit naive as to the implications. It's always a case of, you know, only when it affects me will I do something about it. And that is like a sad trait of humanity, I think, often. Um, that so often we'll wait for something to personally impact us before we take action. And I just hope that people maybe, you know, become a little bit more awake to what's really going on. And as I say, on a kind of grassroots level, with, for instance, the work that I do with, um, we have a 40 Days for Life campaign that, that prays outside the abortion centre. I've had more people than ever joining me this year, wanting to get involved. And I think there's, there's clearly some people whose eyes are being opened and realising that they do need to, you know, get off the fence, for want of a better phrase, um, or, uh, and actually take action. And that's, that is really encouraging. So sometimes, in a way, the good side of difficult situations is it does make people think, what side am I on and at what point am I actually prepared to, you know, put my money where my mouth is and do something? Um, and and for some people that time is now and, and they are taking action. We're seeing a lot more younger people joining in with the work we're doing, which is really encouraging. Obviously, we want people of any age, but it is always good to see that the next generation are recognising that this is also their battle and that they will have to fight it if they want to keep those freedoms. Amen. All right. So let's talk about people who support you one of the things that i find interesting is there's only been two people arrested for silent prayer uh i would have expected there would be tens dozens hundreds if not thousands more uh, in these buffer zones praying silently why have so few people uh, been accused of this crime so also to bear in mind that PSPOs are, are quite a recent thing that have just come okay. in. And I know some people are still looking at trying to um, sort of battle through the courts, trying to find out what, what, what their options are, you know, is, is there a way of overturning them and things like that. So there's, there's a lot of discussion going on and it's all very new for people over here. Um, it, and it's very kind of confusing territory to work out what can or can't be done. Um, and I think sometimes people are quite... Um, as I say, quite confused as to what is allowed. You know, 
I, I would say that my most fundamental, well, one of my most fundamental rights is my right to think and, and no law can take away that. That is the most basic human right. So, you know, I, I would say very definitely, I haven't breached a PSPO um, because of, no law can take away my right to think. Um, PSPOs don't ban people, so it can't ban me. It can only ban behaviour, and that is mm. a behaviour which I don't think can be, can be banned, my thoughts. Um, but I think for some people, maybe they feel quite intimidated by these by these PSPOs or buffer zones. And it, it does kind of beg the question, who's intimidating who? You know, we're the ones that are being accused of intimidating women, despite the fact that they're coming to talk to us and accepting our help. And, you know, I've had letters of written from mums that we've been supporting, trying to say that, you know, please don't censor this for other people, how much it has helped me. Nobody wants to hear them. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's, it's us that's being accused of intimidating, and yet we're the ones being intimidated left, right, and centre. Yeah, freedom is slavery. All right, so the new law says you will not be jailed, you will be fined. Uh, Isabel, how much does it cost to pray now in a buffer zone? Well, as I said, I do believe that it is our, one of our most fundamental rights mm -hmm. to pray. And I don't believe that any law can censor my own, certainly my silent thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, so I would dispute the fact that any, any law can actually censor my prayer. Um, and, and, and I do think that, that people should, should be aware of that, that um, that is one of their most basic rights. They shouldn't be afraid of thinking their prayers, you know, in their own head, wherever they are. You know, as many people have said, you know, we're told to pray unceasingly. This is a command in the Bible. This is something that's very clear um, that, that we that we must constantly pray. Pray constantly, we are told. Um, and and since it, it, these are still public spaces, the areas around abortion centres, if we're allowed to walk through them, then we should be allowed to pray there. Um, so I don't think people should be fearful fearful of where their thoughts might stray when they're in certain places. Uh, but have they put an amount to this next finding that they're going to be doing when they find you? Do they have an amount attached? So for to instance, that? if if it went to court, it could mm -hmm. be it could be in a thousand pound fine. Mm -hmm. um, if it was a court, if it was a fine sent by the council, that that could well be less initially if if someone was paid, um, someone paid it quickly. Mm -hmm. um, but I know for last time, obviously, I was I was going to be sent straight to court, and if I had been found guilty there, the fine would probably have been a thousand pounds. Wow. All right, there's thousands of people watching uh, this interview going, how can I support Isabel? Is there a way they can give to your foundation or uh, support you in financial means? Certainly pray for you. Uh, how can they learn more about what you're doing? I, th I think there's two key things. So what I, I run an organization called March for Life UK. Mm -hmm. So if anyone was kind enough to feel they wanted to support in any financial way, that would be an, an incredible blessing. Clearly, with the amount of trouble that's been gone on, I haven't had much chance to do anything like normal fundraising or anything like that. And it costs, you know, tens of thousands a year to do the work that we do. So if anyone did feel so kind, I, I would be incredibly grateful. Prayer is, is massively what we need. Um, this is a spiritual battle. Um, and we we need to make sure that we're all praying into this um and and praying for our own strength as well and, and praying for each other that we all stay strong um because we we very much need that solidarity in these times um and from a spiritual perspective i think it's very easy for division to creep in um amongst people of faith amongst people who have pro-life beliefs we need to be really aware of that and be aware of those where those divisions can come from and make sure that we stay united in this because we're going to really need each other um, as we move forward, I, I think at the moment things might get more challenging, but we need to stay strong. And, and, and also to make sure that we, that we also stay active. So often it's not necessarily a, a buffer zone that prevents people from going out and maybe praying outside the abortion centre and getting involved. It's their own maybe apathy or lack of priorities or motivation. Um, so to be aware of what's really preventing you, is it that you're fearful? Is that what's actually ruling, you know, governing what you do at the moment and maybe try and act out of love rather than out of fear even if it does mean stepping out of your comfort zone and doing something which seems quite difficult um because that's when we grow stronger with our faith yeah if you could save just one and that's no longer the story we're saving hundreds and thousands uh here in america roe v wade was overturned uh 
just a, a gracious miracle that's uh, saving uh, you know half a million a year and we're gonna have to set forward and stand firm in our faith to continue to watch the abortion industry disappear as we celebrate what life is in its fullest context of beginning middle and end Isabel I pray for you I want to uh, wish you well with God's speed in your ministry and as there's further updates I'd certainly like permission to to get you on camera again as we uh, talk through what's happening in the UK oh God bless you it's been an absolute blessing to be on so thank you for the ministry that you're running all right thank you for watching another episode of Anglican Unscripted tune in next time for another episode